I'm Jorbach. It's good to have you back. This gray plastic wonder is the SH-101. Normally, I'd be making sounds like this on my wall of test equipment, but all of my filters are currently on loan as part of an art exhibit simply titled Found in the Dumpster of a University. Recorded direct into my mixer, it's about as simple as a synthesizer can be. One oscillator, one envelope, monophonic, a classic to be sure, but it's not really what we're talking about today. Many digitally recorded sounds, synthesizers included, even something so lofted as the SH-101 can sound sort of empty when recorded direct. But what if we record it in a way that imparts texture? Suddenly that dry, lifeless sound has a personality, and it feels fit for a finished track. And that's exactly what I'm going to talk to you about today. Techniques for texture in recorded sound. Texture, as I refer to it here and as I consider it applies to recorded sound, can fall into two categories. Textures that imply a sound was recorded in some unique, characteristic physical space, space. or sounds that were recorded in such a way to make it feel like it was recorded in a different time. We will discuss techniques for both, but let's start with space and how to record sound with the elements of the resonance, the reflections, or more generally the quality of being recorded in some physical space. Firstly, and quite obviously, we can just use a reverb pedal. What does a reverb do if not make your sound feel like it's being played in a real-world space? The settings of many pedals reflect this. This is the Empress Reverb's hall setting, and this is it approximating a room. If you're curious, these are the specific settings I have found on the Empress that, to my ears, are an impressively close approximation of a sound recorded in the most irradiated corner of some nuclear testing lab. But why stop there? We can approach sounds that are otherworldly. This is the ghost setting of the Empress, modulating the sound in a way that does not imply a real space, shifting and moving like some otherworldly thing. Adding a reverb effect is the most straightforward and in many ways the most accessible way of let's make this sound feel like it was recorded in a real space. But why don't we just record it in a real space? We can take a speaker and point a microphone at it and record that sound in a real space. And the reflections and the quality of it being recorded in that real space will come with it. Now the character of this mic, my speakers, and the room are all part of this recording, for better or for worse. The character of my monitors isn't particularly unique, nor is the sound of this room. So really it sounds different, not necessarily better. If I was going for a really unique and interesting space, I might go to a cave or something. But the important part is, our sound now has life. Alternatively, we can point the microphone backwards and record the reflections of the room. Mix that in with our dry recorded sound and treat it just like a reverb. Or if those reflections aren't enough, we can double it and delay them in time a little bit. With just a little bit of manipulation, it's now a reverb of our own design. It has a provenance added from this space. My choices in what to record it with, my, my choices in where to hold the microphone, all of that is now included It's part of the history of this recorded sound. It's not that it sounds better or worse than a reverb pedal, and it certainly took more work, but it has more meaning to me. It has more specificity to my experience of listening and recording it. Of course, I'm sure you noticed in those recordings, a little bit of extra sound getting captured. The sound of my fingers playing the keys, maybe a roommate walking upstairs, the sound of pets, machinery. They might be annoying and might seem unprofessional, but sometimes those little elements are what really give a sound life. Those are what really sell a sound as being real and recorded in a real space. 
So much so, in fact, it can be useful to record them separately so they can be mixed in and added later. Field recordings and the like, this can be as simple as capturing footsteps in the cold grass. Maybe something really specific, like the sounds of your roommate watching YouTube a little bit too close. Hi, I'm Heinbach, and it's good to have you back. Or taking a short clip in the middle of the night to catch the sounds of the wind and the rain. Or some of my favorite ambient noise, shuffling through discarded knobs, from old synthesizers test equipment, anything rusty that might have been home to spiders, or could give a person lockjaw. These sounds of reality, these sounds of life, of existing, are sometimes the last piece that it takes for a track to feel complete, for a sound to be convincing, to put everything together in a context. Sometimes they can be the glue that really keeps a track together. Here's a short piano passage from my friend Josh's Making Music, with nothing added and the sound of the rain. Now, onto our second type of texture, the implication of time. These are techniques to impart a recorded sound with, either real or manufactured, the degradation, the artifacts, or more generally the quality of a sound having been recorded in a different time. We can capture these genuinely and quite effectively by just recording to outdated mediums. Here's that very first TR8 and SH-101 combo recorded direct to tape. This is my Akai reel-to-reel. -reel. It's not in great shape, it's not calibrated, the tape isn't new, but that's all good. It gives us more of what we're looking for, more of that sound of tape. Another outdated medium, and really my favorite as of late, this is the Roland JS30. It's a 90 sampler that can run at 8 or 16 bits. Any sounds recorded to it instantly have this feeling of nostalgia, this feeling of the past. Of course, reel-to-reel and an 8-bit sampler aren't the only ways of getting a little dirt. This is a Panasonic desktop dictaphone, and it records to microcassettes. Microcassettes are extraordinarily low fidelity, and not useful for much because of that. But in recording to them and playing them back, you capture so much of the quality that feels outdated, that feels old. And in the spirit of our field recordings, I'm recording just some spoken word from one of my favorite books and something I really consider to be light reading, a textbook from 1977, The Evolution of Electronic Music. For me, that's nearly contemporary. Determining overall timbre structures is a viable compositional technique. Timbre can be treated as a function of pitch, duration, and amplitude. Of course, I haven't mentioned one of the most popular and accessible methods of recording to an outdated medium, cassette tapes. Let's combine these techniques into one final piece recorded on my Tascam 424 Mark II cassette recorder. I've started with some Rhodes chords on the JS30, then I've pitched that up to double speed on the JS30, and recorded that to a cassette running at its fastest speed. Then I dropped that down to normal speed, or half of our original, so we have the down sampling from the JS30 on the tape, and then the tape artifacts from playing at half speed, the best speed. On, on another track, I'm going to record off of the dictaphone. First instance of intermodulation, first instance of intermodulation then entails the regulation turning of source 2, but the amplitude of source, source, source 1. And fade the volume in and out as I record it, then direct to the cassette recorder the sounds of the rain, And finally, the SH-101 through some reverb. So 
just contained in these four tracks, there are layers of texture through space, through time, through outdated mediums. This piece sounds the way it does because of the way it was recorded, and it's really clear to hear those things. Yes, this is a sketch I threw together as an example, and not necessarily my proudest work, but it includes texture from all sorts of places. In some ways, the texture is as important as the notes we're playing. All of these things that can make a sound feel unique and purposeful. So, I hope you find inspiration in any of these techniques, maybe all of them, and think differently about the way you record your sound, and think differently about the way you consider a sound finished, or have a new idea of an element that might help your track feel finished. Thank you for watching. I'll be seeing you in the next one. Bye. <laughs> I don't think he sounds like that. There you go. I had a different pair of glasses on. Could you tell? <laughs> I needed to feel like less like me. So there you go. I did a parody a year ago with Bad Gear. I really liked putting myself in somebody else's shoes. And this year it's Heinbach. This is more of a style parody. I want it to... I want to make you think of Heinbach the entire time and talk about things that he might talk about, but still, in a lot of ways, it's a Jorb video, and it feels like a Jorb video. I like to do it that way. I like to pay homage while still providing you a real episode with real information, and I do sincerely hope that any of those things I brought up are inspiring to you or help you think of things differently, because that's what Heinbach does for me. The way he approaches music seems so genuine and completely motivated by himself and his interests, and I personally find that very, very inspiring. So I hope you enjoyed it, Heinbach. I think I hope you think this is funny if you ever see it. If you don't, that's probably better. <laughs> Thank you for watching. My name's Jorb. <laughs> I love gear. No jokes until April 1st next year. <laughs> Thanks for watching. Cheers and so long. <laughs> I don't think he does this. I don't think he does any of these things. For me, that's nearly contemporary. <laughs>